Victorian Periodical Parade. So, as some of you may know, I've been um, using my time in quarantine partially to read um, this month's uh, edition of the Cornhill Magazine um, from 1862. Uh, I chose 1862 because that is the year that I have a bound copy of. Um, when we lived in Dallas, we had a huge um, used bookstore and sometimes I could find just really different things like this, like entire bound annual editions of magazines from the Victorian era. So I would just buy what they have. Um, I tend to specialize in about 40 years after this, the 1890s, but this is what I have. I've been reading it, kind of wanting to think about what the Victorians were doing um, on this month, 160 years ago. Um, so much of our life right now feels kind of like we're living in the past with things moving a little bit more slowly in some ways and and a sort of unprecedented uncertainty that I don't think we're used to in the modern era. So anyway, I've just been doing that. And then I posted some of my the things I've read about and a couple of my friends so that I should make it a, a YouTube channel. Um, I found a friend who I lived with in Norway who's interested in working this up into a more developed concept. Um, anyway, I just got excited today and decided I would do a little mini Facebook live and see what, what people like, how it feels to do this if people don't like it and send that off to my friend so he can see what he thinks we should do for a bigger project. So, um, I really like one of my favorite hobbies whenever I have free time is just to like flip through Victorian magazines or, um, domestic like self-help guides and just see what they talked about. Um, to me, it feels a little bit like time travel, uh, not just to know like the most famous things they were reading, which, you know, is, is fun, but feels a little bit like knowing that Americans in the 21st century liked Mission Impossible ones. Like that's only the highlights. And I'm always really curious about the daily grind and the nitty gritty, like what were they thinking about salmon prices that month of that year? Um, and it's, it's just, it's always like getting to see truly the closest thing I can think of to time travel and getting to know what was on their minds. It's also been like a surprise because they wrote about really surprising things. So um, Cornhill Magazine was one, became one of the most important Victorian magazines of the day. Um, I don't think it was known for being super left-leaning or super right-leaning. It was just pretty, I don't know, kind of slice of life represented a lot of topics. In its later years, it was thought of as being a little bit fussy and only willing to publish really um, politically correct views that wouldn't offend anyone. Um, and so it got a reputation for offending no one and saying, therefore, nothing. Um, they rejected Thomas Hardy's Return of the Native, which is like not even one of his most controversial books. So, but of course, that was written quite a bit later. Um, I want to say 80s, 1880s, Return of the Native. I could be off 70s or 80s. Um, but when it first um, was produced, and this is right in its beginning, it started in 1860, and this is two years later, uh, Thackeray was the editor, and it was just sort of like blew everyone away, including the editors, for how popular it became at this point. So it's kind of in its prime when I'm reading it. Um, and every article has been like this fun little surprise. Um, I, the first one I read, well, the first thing was a, a part of a novel by Thackeray. Um, and they would serialize those monthly. And then the second thing was about um, superstitions about the supernatural and sort of using critical thinking to explain why that can never be reasonable or logical to believe. And then yesterday I read something about the development of warships after a really important battle in the American Civil War that was freaking Britain out and wondering if they were going to lose their naval stronghold in the world stage. And so that was really interesting. Um, and so I have some thoughts about how I would present those if I did a, a live or a Facebook or a YouTube thing. 
but I thought I would just flip to what's next and sort of enjoy that with you guys. I'll do a little brief reading and hopefully some explanation of what, what it means um, to uh, contextualize it for you. And I'll just keep it really quick, I hope. Um, so the very next thing is part of a novel, and I'm a lot less interested, as I said, in the fiction when I look through periodicals. So I'm going to skip over that novel. Um, the next thing is called Rotten Row, and this is a feature I've noticed in every month where they do a sort of um, cultural commentary seems too broad, but a sort of critique of <laughs> what we might call like basic Karen culture. Um, they'll take something that's a pretty standard practice like balls or um, uh, the way parliament is handled or uh, afternoon tea and just kind of make fun of it a little bit um, with a sort of snooty attitude. Um, this one is about um, the practice of taking, and I've just looked at this, so I'm just glancing at it and giving you, I can tell right now what it's about. Um, if you've ever seen like a, a Merchant Ivory or period piece uh, with female protagonists, there'll usually be a part where women are riding in a carriage around and around and around a park. Um, that's what they're critiquing here. Um, and about to make fun of. And they always, in every month I've seen, they come with this um, pull-out illustration that's so detailed and never very complimentary of the people it depicts. I can't, it's hard to show it. I'm already seeing this might be something that would be better for me to um, include a picture of, a still image of later on. You can see it goes all the way out. And they're always, I've noticed in this year edition anyway, they're always characterized by these incredibly crowded um, images. So it's not just a plot image, but it's a plot image in which every square centimeter seems to be used. And again, that's generally, if you could get a closer look, and I'll hopefully be able to post a picture at some point, if you could get a closer look, that sheer volume of bodies tends to itself be a comment and not a complimentary one of just everybody trying to socially climb in this Victorian space, whether it's a ballroom or here, a garden. Okay, so I'm gonna read a little bit, and if I need to explain some more, I will. Um, then I'll read a little bit more and then just say bye. And hopefully, hopefully somebody can give me some feedback. What you think? Um, which is it for air or exercise? Or is it to see or be seen that the fashionable world and the world that wishes to be fashionable congregate on one side only of a, of Hyde Park of an afternoon in the season? And the season is the London season when people would travel rich people from their country homes to London to be seen basically. And yes, you would go right around in Hyde Park to be seen and to get air. All the world is on the stage, you would think. So great is the crowd and the equestrians are the chief performers. It is a kind of Astley's and the spectators sit in reserved seats, one penny plain, two pence with arms and survey mankind on horseback from Hyde Park corner to Kensington. It is a genteel comedy that is being performed with very little action and scarcely any dialogue. As a sight, it is very cheap at a penny, more especially when you come to compare it with other entertain entertainments in other theaters for which you pay quite other prices for uncomfortable stalls in unpleasant atmospheres looking at often tiresome performances. Here, at least, there is fresh air and room enough to stretch your legs to any extent, or you may, even for an extra penny, place them on another chair. Chiefs out of war and statement in and out of place, members of parliament and of the stock exchange, clergymen and barristers, city swells, country gentlemen, merchant princes, heavy and light dragoons, railway contractors, peers, peeresses, foreign ministers and bishops on horseback, all jostling one another up and down, cantering or prancing or creeping along or standing still or sometimes running away. 
The ladies and gentlemen who constitute the spectators sit along beside the pathway under the trees, partly sheltered from the rays of the evening sun, and criticize good-naturedly and make remarks of a friendly but pointed nature upon the costume or style or of locomotion or features of each individual in the procession of pedestrians which streams lazily past, marching in slow time, as it were, before the elegant occupants of the seats who are reviewing them. So again, now you can see why this very crowded image is its own sort of uh, jibe. Gentlemen are perched in rows upon the iron railings looking like listless birds, very much of a feather, who have flocked together on a telegraph wire. Amongst the company is to be seen that favorite young gentleman of mind and of the period, whose eyebrows are always raised unreasonably, and whose object it is supposed is to exhort, extort a larger amount of attention and admiration from the world than it is in the world's power to give. That's a joke. Sometimes it's hard to tell with these um, long sentences, and forgive me if you knew it was a joke, but I'm used to having to translate those sort of things for my students. He thinks it is the right thing to do, you know, to take a stroll just to show himself, you know, and see what there is to be seen, you know. And so he marches languidly and laboriously and constrainedly along. And he does so not looking very happy the while. He casts his eye anxiously to the right and to the left and straight before and every other way in a painful and useless endeavor to see everywhere at once and receive the salutes and recognitions of his acquaintances and is in a state of constant terror lest he should overlook or miss some one of consequence. So the you know, you know, you know is a mocking of his, um, uh, the way he has a talking or the way that sort of um, person has a talking that they're critiquing. And a little from the rank and fashion spread over the grass are many little children attended by nursemaids who are attended by often royal horse guards, red or blue, and sometimes by a park keeper who in a previous stage of existence has been in the wars and is covered with medals and seems conscious of the fact. The park is always haunted on these occasions by a few aged dandies of bygone days, venerable relics of the fashion that is no more. Melancholy objects, much like dismal ghosts returned and wandering amid the scenes where they once were the glasses of fashion and probably the molds of form as well. They walk slowly and as, as if from habit, but not taking much interest apparently in what is going on around them. Probably most of the faces are new to them like the fashions and the great swells who dazzled mankind by the splendor of their personal appearance, the cut of their coats, the shape of their whiskers, the smartness of their equipages, the beauty of their horses and all the other things that do dazzle mankind in the park when they were young and when George IV was king are no more to be seen. Quite different ideas of right and wrong in dress and manners now prevail. And that's it. That's the whole uh, uh, critique of society. I see one of these about midway through each monthly installment, um, always about some sort of uh, society affair, meaning uh, something where you were supposed to be seen and see other people and um, climb up the social ladder. Um, they're always apparently pretty short um, because these seem pretty um, form-like. And they always, in this magazine, have this little pull-out illustration. Most magazines of the time, at least at least once per issue, would have what's called an illustrated plate, which is a, a thicker piece of paper, often in color, but not always. Um, and that was sort of a, a selling point. Of course, you know, they didn't necessarily have photographs in these periodicals at the time. They might have had engraved plates of photograph, but that was, they were expensive. So having a few of those was really um, uh, sort of a key selling point. In some ladies magazines, the illustrated plate would be the latest and most fashionable dress, um, sometimes a dress pattern. Um, often it was a picture of famous people uh, or famous houses. And so it's, kind of, I think, can tell you a little bit about this magazine that their engraved plate or their illustration that they're marketing is one to critique, in a way, the status quo of what other magazines were doing. And yet, this was always kind of a, a widely popular magazine, so you can't think of it really as uh, super cutting edge or, or um, super edgy, really. Um, anyway, so I just thought I would 
just try out what my friends suggested and see what people thought if it was fun. I'm glad we got kind of a short article because most of these, um, they can drag on quite a bit. And so my thought is that I'll be just reading random selections as I go through them, um, not the whole thing, but this one was really short, so. Okay, so I'm assuming there's no questions, um, but I'd love to hear feedback, what you guys think and what you think could be fun or if, yeah. Okay, bye. Go on over to Twitter and follow us at Victorian Parade, um, and we'll see you again on Friday. Uh, we're gonna try to do the schedule Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Hit us up with any questions. Uh, next time, I think uh, Dr. Kari Nixon is going to be reading an article from 1862 edition of the Cornhill Magazine. So, yes, please give us any and all uh, reviews as you have. Thank you very much, and have a great day.